Okay, thanks for staying, even though the yummy food is being served outside. So I'm going to be quick. Um, I'd like to share this idea with you. Uh, I'm Daniel, I am research fellow at Utvashulan University in Budapest. And I'm going to share a project with you that we do with Erlang Solutions. And this is a security analyzer for Erlang. So we know that Erlang systems are resilient and robust, and we love it. And it's due to the, uh, the system's ability to self-heal. So if something goes wrong, the system is going to make sure that if processes go down, something crashes, it's going to recover. And this is amazing. And this is, um, this actually allows programmers to use the principle of let it crash. So when you write your systems, you don't have to prepare for everything. You couldn't anyway. Don't prepare for anything. Um, prepare for the meaningful inputs. Prepare for the reasonable inputs. And let the system handle the rest, right? So this is, um, this is something that allows us to write uh, readable programs and at the same time write scalable and robust programs. And this suggests us that there's no need for input validation. So when you receive messages, you have to prepare for the meaningful ones and just don't worry about the rest. It's going to be handled by the system. But this is not always the case, because there are some standard functions, there are some built-in functions that can actually um, leak data, lose data, or actually make your node crash. And so in some, in some cases, in some scenarios, you shouldn't let it crash. Um, you have to make some validation on, on input data and protect your system against vulnerabilities. Otherwise, your node may go down. And this is real. We made experiments, and we analyzed a lot of open source Erlang projects. We found vulnerabilities, and we managed to bring nodes down. And we are going to share some details with you um, towards the end of the talk. Right, so what kind of vulnerabilities are we talking about here? Um, a lot, a lot of different vulnerabilities there are in the system, but um, let me show you the simplest and uh, maybe the most well-known example, uh, Atom creation in Erlang. So atoms are limited. Um, you can have, like by default, like one million atoms in your system, and if you exceed the limit, it's going to go down. And um, this is really trouble, so you can do two, two things, actually. One is that you don't create atoms at runtime. <laughs> You avoid that, you avoid the problem. Or you do it, but you do it with care. Well, many people do the, the, the latter. Um, but you would think that if this is really a risk, nobody uses it, right? They do. Um, we analyze the projects and we have found a lot of instances, maybe not list to atom, but binary to atom, or similar functions that do create atoms at runtime. Um, most of the vulnerabilities we look for are actually um, documented in the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. You can check it. They have um, a nice documentation where they provide you guidelines, um, maybe rules, to follow if you want to code secure Erlang systems. This is an informal list of best practices. That's very important. It's an outstanding achievement, but what matters here is the word informal. It's in English. So if you want to check your system for compliance, what you can do is you go to the guidelines, read it, understand it, then you go back to your code and you check whether your code is compliant with the rules. You have to do it by hand. Or we are programmers, so what we do is automation. So you can make it uh, text-based. So you look for these built-in functions or standard functions that are vulnerable and you try to locate them. You can do grep or you can do syntax-based methods. But the problem with these, compared to semantics-based methods, is that these are going to give you uh, false negatives because they may be not able to recognize Apple, um, um, apply or dynamic function calls. And they may give you false positives because we understand that there's this concept of using it with care, using it consciously, under control. And such systems may not be able to recognize this. So we can do better, we believe. Um, let me jump back to the example. So is it safe? to apply list to atom to this string. Um, well, the guidelines say, no, no, don't do it. It's risky. Sometimes it's risky. If you have a variable concatenated to the string and you just know nothing about the variable, then it may be risky because if you do this in an iteration and the var may take different values, it may take up one million values and your node goes down. But at the same time, we have this idea that you can use it with care. What do we mean by this? For example, if you do data flow analysis and you can infer, infer that there's only one possible value that can reach the variable, then you are safe. Or if it's five different or 100 different, you are safe. On the other hand, 
if there's a function we have no information about, then it may be risky. And it's even worse if it's an iteration or recursive function. So, is it safe to do this? Depends. Depends on the context, that's what we say. Some tools would actually report it as positive all the time because they say it's not safe. What we can do here is that we can, we can check the context and observe whether this limit I'm talking about is there statically or it's enforced dynamically. So how do we do that? Um, we have a static analyzer system and it has scope analysis, data flow analysis and control flow analysis. All of these are specific to Erlang at the moment. And these are able to connect these potentially vulnerable building functions and standard functions to their relevant semantic context. And from that, we can actually tell whether it's a false positive. So it's, it's, it's used with care, it shouldn't be reported, or it's a true positive. If it's a true positive, we can actually outline a possible exploitation. So we can give a hint on how to trigger the problem. So our solution, our approach comes with more um, resource consumption, more um, time needed, but at the same time it comes with very, um, very well-defined benefits. So we can minimize the number of false negatives, we are not going to miss hits, uh, we minimize false positives, we are not going to generate these false alarms, and if there's a true positive, then we can help you trigger the problem. Let me share two case studies with you that we have found in widely used open source Erlang projects. The first one is related to this Atom creation problem. So when you do binary to list and list to Atom on F, and you have no information about what F is, then you may be in trouble. And this is something that we took from, literally we took it from an open source project. Um, a, a project that all you know and per, per, may, maybe use as well. Uh, and all we did was uh, renaming the functions and the variables to make it anonymized. So this is actually something that we found and we managed to trace it back to API calls and bring down nodes. Also, I have to say that this is not necessarily vulnerable. You could actually make sure to either have a static limit on how many different values it can take. So if you, if you can say that there's a fixed set and only that set can give values um, to the uh, to the list that goes to this to atom, you would be safe. Or it was a function, if there was a function that validates whether this is safe, then we could, we, we could be on the safe side. But you need data for analysis for that. And let me share, you, uh, share with you another example that we found. This is another category called injection. So when you do OS command, you have to be very careful not to leak information from your Erlang system to other commands. And if um, you pass a variable to the OS command, you have to be careful what the variable contains. So you, you actually have to safeguard or sanitize the contents. In this particular example, it was not. So we found it as vulnerable. If there was actually a function, which we call a validator function, that we could, um, uh, by data flow analysis, tell that the data, the variable A, passes through and it's safeguarded, of course, we could actually mark this as negative and don't bother the programmer with it. So we have made a lot of experiments, and I have two guys from Erlang Solutions here who are going to share some more uh, findings with you. All right, can you hear me? All right, okay, so this number is, uh, is what we managed to uh, basically generate after we run the uh, analysis and uh, the whole system with five open source projects that are uh, widely used and very popular and everybody here probably use them and are using them right now and where actually other applications are also built on top of them so the the issue here is that we uh, we might find that these problems might even leak above so this is something that we wanted to make sure everybody knows that there are these uh, vulnerabilities or this number of vulnerabilities and then Robert now will break down the true uh, issues So out of these uh, categories or these vulnerabilities, 71% uh, is the leading category, which is denial of service. Uh, these operations are mainly leading to atom exhaustion, uh, which can cause your system and node crash. The second biggest category is uh, the injection vulnerabilities with 12%. Uh, in this category, you can find OS commands, file-related operations, 
These are with when you have an unverified input. Also, when you load uh, your code dynamically into your system, this can also lead to um, injection vulnerabilities if you load some kind of uh, malicious code. But not just these uh, categories are here. We have race conditions, um, which case you want to travel or traverse an ETS table without first uh, locking it, for example, or first you spawn a process and then you want to link it, um, which can lead to uh, some race conditions as uh, the process uh, linkage should be an atomic uh, um, operation. Um, another category is the man in the middle when, uh, for example, you have an unsecure crypto function, you establish a connection with uh, that one, which can uh, give the possibility a man to step in the middle. Um, and for example, the last one here is uh, when you have a badly configured node and uh, you you have a badly configured node and uh, you have the remote connection to that node and this can give access to uh, someone from a remote node connection to even your machine, not just your node. All right, so how, how did we manage to actually uh, yeah, disrupt the RabbitMQ node? I think that the, it's a coincidence that there is a RabbitMQ summit on the other side, but yeah, wink, wink. Uh, basically, so we found the vulnerability in the uh, report. Uh, what we did is that we went through the highest ones, so the highest severity, we ma we make we to make sure that we are going to actually trigger something. So what we did, we uh, isolated the issue, and then we, uh, with the help of uh, Refactorel, what we did is that we uh, tried to f like follow the path uh, that that uh, variable uh, followed, and then we managed to find the API that actually helped us to trigger that one. Then we wrote uh, a script that actually called that API uh, multiple times, where we actually triggered the uh, the uh, RabbitMQ to uh, to die. So they actually increased the limit of the uh, atoms to from one million to to five million, but. Basically, you can do it. You can just uh, call even the API one time with these many numbers of uh, atoms that actually this variable is created as an atom later, uh, but you, you actually can manage to know how it happens. Basically, we brought a, a RabbitMQ you know, down very easily. <laughs> In actually less than, less than an hour, we, we managed to find the vulnerability, find the API, and then actually go, go down uh, that path. So yeah, let's, let's hope that uh, this was helpful. Maybe questions? Okay, thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. We have some time for questions before we go to lunch, and I see your raised hands. Thank you. All right, so my question, and I already posted on Hua as well. Uh, you said you found vulnerabilities in multiple open source projects. Did, did you submit pull requests or open issues so do, on them to fix those? Actually, uh, this is the, the, the purpose of this one. So we didn't want to disclose this issue. So that's, that's why we didn't want to say what they are so that we can give them the chance to fix it. So we are going to uh, create like maybe issue uh, uh, so that they can track what is happening uh, to give them the chance to look into it, of course. Uh, so these are open source projects and then we want to basically contribute to the safety of these open source projects. And we wanted to actually inform that these issues are, even though the guidelines are telling to not use this sort of, uh, for example, atom creation, we found that it's very widely used. Uh, so yeah, we, want, we will give them the chance to look into it, yes, of course, yeah. All right, do we have more questions? Yes. So uh, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. Uh, I have just one question. Uh, so data flow analysis for sequential computation is uh, rather well defined and well known. But uh, does your tool also take into account uh, message passing in the data flow analysis or in any of the other analysis you're doing? At this point, we're going to invite Melinda to watch. Yes, so Melinda is going to be very good at this. <laughs> Thank you. I'm the data flow guy in this team, so that's why I pop up on the state. So yes, Refactorer is able to uh, track message passing. So basically, we can detect uh, data flow through messages. Uh, you have to know that it has its static boundaries. So 
anything that we can detect from the source code. Uh, so if we find the appropriate process, we use data flow analysis to detect the processes, that which processes spawned in which point. And once we are able to detect that, then we try to follow the uh, data flow through the messages as well. Uh, it has an additional cost, you have to know. So once you turn the concurrent uh, data flow analysis, then it has an additional cost because to calculate the concurrent uh, uh, data flow, we have to run data flow and so on. And, and it could be done in an iteration as well. It's uh, by default done just once, but you can do it in an iteration as well if you want. Um, it just looks super interesting. That was a great talk. Thanks very much. Um, and as an Elixir guy, I'm just wondering, do you have any idea when this might flow up to be available as an Elixir tool? All right. So we will announce an Elixir uh, compatibility, but uh, it's going to be more clear for us by December. So we will have a timeline, and we will probably announce it on the forums and make sure that everybody knows about it. Uh, but for now, this is just for Erlang. And this is what the university, actually, uh, the Alta Soft and the Alta uh, Research did is for Erlang uh, for now, yes. OK. We have time for one last question. The same question, oh, nice. OK. <laughs> um, any more last questions? Going once, going twice. OK. Oh, one, one more, OK. Uh, hi, so I can imagine that uh, any kind of data flow uh, analysis and well, any stuff that uh, the tool does uh, also probably relies to some degree on the inferred types, probably. So I was wondering whether it's, no? Absolutely, it doesn't rely on types? No, no, okay. not yet. So it's just purely on the uh, semantic representation of refactor R. Okay. So uh, we just, it, actually it's an academic result. It published in a paper that how we uh, have the, done the data flow analysis. So we just uh, use the uh, semantic representation of refactor R and define the data flow graph based on that and we do a reaching on, it, on the top of it. So yeah, it, uh, because it has no type information about the, uh, about the variables or expressions, it might over approximate. So the results could be further shrinked if we would uh, use uh, uh, type information as well. So that's obviously a good point. So now it's uh, because the lack of the type information, it over approximates the uh, real data flow. Mm -hmm.